You're just in time for your weekly most comprehensive look at the world of business and economics. A warm and hearty welcome to another edition of Business Redefined. Now, my guest uh, had a conversation at the SME conference, which Nation Media Group hosted not too far back. And the conversation of dead assets, which he evoked, has gone round and round. We've received lots of feedback about this uh, subject matter. Dr. Julius Kimnetich, welcome on set. Thank you, Amboko. Dead assets. Let me just give some context. You're talking about SMEs and how they can unlock liquidity and capital for their own use. Some would argue that um, the new ones that you brought on board didn't capture some of the dynamics that Kenyans confront. For example, there's a social angle to this in this sense. I was speaking to a couple of players in the uh, pension management industry and they will tell you that uh, if you take uh, an assessment of the retirees in this country, the bulk of them will take their pension payout in lump sum. Yes. Majority of them will exhaust it in about five years. Yes. And they will have exhausted it not having found a suitable structure to live in once they retire in the village. That is why that issue of constructing at home seems to be a key issue for Kenyans. Don't you think then uh, how to quantify that as a return becomes a problem? Because clearly there's that safety you retire with knowing at least I have this safety net in, uh, over my head. I agree. Uh, when I provoked that thought, I was talking about the context that, one, we live in a country with pretty low savings. If you look at the central bank statistics, our savings rate is now between 8 to 10 percent of GDP. But Vision 2030 desires that we go to around 30 percent. So from just from a macroeconomic point of view, we have very scarce capital. And so when we then invest our little scarce capital in assets which are not generating sufficient return, in fact, some of it is negative in the village, that is where now we are saying, why should we be putting so much in the village, you know, very scarce capital, in assets which we hardly use, probably for some people it gives them some social capital, then uh, we are doing that mismatch. Because then, who then dominate our economy? Those who have sufficient savings. The largest savers in the world are the Chinese. They are at 55%, they are about, of GDP, which is pretty high. So here we are utilizing Chinese capital because they are very good savers, and yet the little savings we ourselves have is being then put in assets which generate very little return. And that mismatch is what we need to correct as a society because we can't afford those very expensive assets in the village which are not generating any return. So let me ask you, Dr. Ari, how would you propose then we crowd in this so-called dead capital um, for those who have constructed, I mean, the houses in the village? Clearly, you're still in the city. You're not earning anything from it, apart from the, the peace of mind that it gives you that I have some structure at home. How would you propose then we, we really crowd it in to more useful and yield-chasing assets? When we were writing Vision 2030 in the year 2006-2007, that question came up. And uh, I was in the team that was looking at the tourism pillar. So we said, because of uh, the tourism industry was growing faster at the time, and we don't have enough beds. So we said, how can we organize these homes into Airbnb type? Airbnb at that time was not even existing. But we said homestays. We called it hom homestays. So that then we say, if Amboko is here in Nairobi, okay, Amboko's brother can run a tourism facility of, say, five homes in, within his neighborhood. And then now he rents them for people who come to, say, Kakamega and, and uh, have nowhere to stay. And so you do a timeshare. So that then you say, okay, I'm coming to my home on, say, the 5th of September. Then we book you the 5th of September and say, I'm staying for seven days. The rest of the days are rented out. But you need management companies who then understand the business, 
will do excellent customer service and make sure that the facility is maintained to the standard that is required. That's what Airbnb is all about. So that's the framework I was thinking and saying, these assets are already there. How can we utilize them as national assets to generate income and expand a tourism industry that we have competitive advantage globally? So those are the things that now we must think creatively. And to me, that is one step uh, that we need to, to take as a country. The mortgage regulations of 2020 provided that um, any person in, uh, active in a pension scheme can be able at any point to tap up to 40% of their accrued earnings, capped at 7 million shillings towards purchase of a home. That by itself, I'd imagine, Dr. tells you something about even the law itself is being amended to adjust to the Kenya, to the Kenyanese of this home ownership and the pursuit of it. Do you view that as a counterproductive step? Do you view it as a step in the, in the right direction? Because uh, clearly the whole idea is to incentivize uh, purchase of homes. Agreed. But you see, if we are going to reinforce again rural homes, then we are multiplying our inefficiency of capital formation. So I wouldn't recommend that to be the direction unless it is in an urban area which then has potential to be rented out, has potential to also save you uh, investing in a dead asset. So we need to look at that. I, I wouldn't say no at this stage, but we need to look at it because we must then have an aspiration of how we use capital, very scarce capital in our economy. We want to make sure that we maximize the use of capital that gives society, in aggregate, a very good return. That should be our aim. And so if any policy that then negates that, then we need to look at it and say, are we actually going in the right direction? Because what really pains me is our economy because we are inefficient users of capital, other people's capital coming in and earning incredible return as we watch because we are short of that capital. A good example is Nairobi Expressway. Nairobi Expressway is a BOT, Build, Operate and Transfer. Now, whose, whose capital is being used? It's Chinese capital. Now, if, for example, we had given this to a large pension fund and uh, RBA rules allows it because infrastructure, there's a limit of 30%. If, for example, we had a large pension fund to put in what the Chinese have put in, that return would have come to Kenya and stayed in Kenya. So what I want to ask all Kenyans is capital is very scarce let us use it efficiently. And let us then, at macro level, the policy level, create policies that then support you know, efficient use of capital, and then we enhance our saving to that aspirational target of 30% of GDP, which is still in Vision 2030. I don't think we have lost that track of Vision 2030. It was a very good aspiration, because then that's what triggers now domestic investment, and foreign investment is just a top up. But now we are desperate for foreign direct investment because local domestic saving is very low and it cannot trigger investment. That's why we put that threshold of 30% of GDP to then trigger local capital formation. So we are in a very weak position right now. Doctor, if you look at the pensions industry, uh, now that you've mentioned it quite a bit, the assets under management are valued about 1.4 trillion shillings. Uh, if you look at how they have been disaggregated across asset classes, the more sophisticated investors will tell you we're not getting value for money because it is low risk, low return in fixed income. So much as you would tout that as a, an avenue through which we could deploy this capital, the more sophisticated investors will tell you no. If anything, we'd rather deploy our capital outside this country. Do you think that argument holds? Okay, you see, capital also must go with opportunities. We must create the opportunities in our country 
that utilizes that capital. So we must go in tandem, okay? So we must give incentives for innovation and creativity in the economy, and we say capital exists, and then now we match the two. So Kenya's economy has not been very good at creating opportunities even when savings is available. So the little savings that we have made, the 1.3 trillion, for example, you're talking about, is not being matched with the level of innovation in the economy that attracts that capital. So look, look at, for example, uh, oil in Turkana. Whose capital do we use? Foreign capital. Foreign capital, okay? But did we structure the deal in such a way that we could attract uh, local capital to then put their savings in a venture like Turkana, which was a very high risk? The answer is no. So we must all work together, government, private sector, and we see how would we then incentivize people to then put their capital in assets like those that give good return so that then as capital, it encourages people to save more. I mean, I would like to see our pension industry go to 5 trillion, 10 trillion. Why not? In years to come. And as that capital then is earned, you know, fixed income uh, securities, it's a very lazy way of investing. We need to look at more creative ways. Okay? And so opportunities then must exist. So we must all work together and say, are we creating opportunities in our market for efficient use of capital? And it shows we have a long journey, a very long journey. Because when you look at fixed income securities, that's just safe. You know, what I was saying in that conference that, you know, you can put your money in T-bills and sleep, yes. okay? But we are hoping government then uses it for infrastructure rather than paying salaries. Yeah. So, you know, we have to make sure that capital is used. So we must create then a safe environment for private investors to thrive, okay? Utilize that capital much more efficiently to create jobs, to create return for, good return for investors. All these things must happen within a certain context. Let's now put the shoe on the other side yes. from the policymaker standpoint. I watched your clip and I was sharing with one of the policymakers in this country. And he said, look, we can argue about debt capital and we can argue about lazy ways of investing, but take this case in, case in point. Yes. We have structured Emma Kiba, inviting those at the very bottom of the economic pyramid to come and deploy their capital here. Majority would still love to do the merry-go-rounds in the village where we put our money together, we, we aggregate it one month, we give, uh, Julia's keeping it is. The next month they give Julia and Samboko. There's no return there, apart from the fact that we have aggregated our capital and given you. So why don't Kenyans take up the opportunities which have been created? And that was, that was a question. Uh, it, it's a question of education, okay, and building confidence. I would like um, CMA, okay, the regulator for capital markets to come out very strongly, you know. Uh, the Securities Exchange Commission in the U.S. is very strong and trusted. And it's trusted over time. Trust comes over time. So that then, when they know that uh, a player cannot come in the market if they have poor credentials, because it's my lifetime savings. So when I put my savings in a company, okay, or in an instrument like, say, Emma Kiba, I know, I am certain that I will get a good return, okay. So why the merry-go-rounds uh, are successful is trust, because these are my friends, okay. So we are now saying, let us have an instrument that is, first of all, virtual, okay, there is no physical certificate even, yeah. it's virtual, and I am confident it will be paid. So what we need to educate our people and build very strong regulatory environment with a high level of trust, very high level. Then people now will, you know, slowly then seed that saving and say, I would rather save because it gives me a return of say 7% or 8% rather than my chama, which is small capital and 
it can't do much. Exactly. So that's where the critical difference is. So I, I would suggest that CMA introduces very tight regulations, okay? And remember, Kenyans also have a history of Ponzi schemes. So these Ponzi schemes creates very low confidence that you know, people you know, promise heaven, and then within a short time, uh, that's, that investment just falls by the wayside. So there's a lot of confidence building in the marketplace, so that then people are confident that my little earned savings, I can put it in an instrument that is solid and is secure. The reason why even people put it in T-bills is it's constitutional guaranteed. So that confidence is there. Although some people are hesitant. That's why they put their money, say, in a fixed savings account in a bank at 4%. 4%. And then the same day, the bank writes a check to Central Bank and uh, get 8%. So you get 4% by just writing a check. So there's a lot of work to educate the public on some of these instruments and ensuring that the returns are as good as guaranteed 100%, then that confidence is there. Your core business day-to-day -day is underwriting risk. How do you think we can best de-risk SMEs in this market? SMEs, the, the challenge with SMEs for me is scale. A lot of our SMEs are operating solo, you know, small uh, little kiosk rather than, you know, large-scale shops and supermarkets. That's the, that's the analogy. So we need to have confidence that we can pull resources together. Part of what um, I said in that clip was aggregation. Now, aggregation requires a cultural mindset. It's a mindset to trust each other so that chama, but at large scale. That's where capital markets then become the, the platform where you can trade ownership of companies, which is shares. So my, my, my belief is Kenya SMEs need to aggregate. So therefore, from a policy standpoint, I am advocating for a ministry of SMEs. To do all these things requires somebody to just concentrate on it. Because if, say, I was the minister for trade today, I would focus on the big boys, naturally. Because then, uh, the big boys are the ones who control the percentages. But if we aggregate SMEs, they have the potential to be also the big boys. Uh, there was an aggregator for Paretram, yeah. it died. There was an aggregator for grains, K KFA, it died. There was an aggregator for cotton, it died. So. If we revive all these aggregators, then SMEs in the villages will just, we don't have to have a lot of skill. Your job is just to drop your produce at the aggregation level and they do the value addition naturally. Dr. Sari, two quick riders there. Yes. Um, first is that if you read the MSME policy of 2013, yes. what you're saying you propose we have a ministry of SMEs is the whole reason why we have the MSME authority. Yes. It was actually tasked with that job of ensuring that the operating environment for SMEs is enhanced from time to time. Having worked for government for around 20 years, leaving the drive for SMEs at an authority level is just uh, leaving them at the mercy of big boys and they will just be trampled on. You can't drive SMEs at parastatal authority level. You can't. It has to be at cabinet level and anchored in very clear policies through an act of parliament. So there has to be a very clear, just the same way we have, say, Agriculture Act, we must have the SME Act, which clearly defines how they are going to be supported and allocated resources direct from parliament under a ministry, a minister that sits in the cabinet. That is the only way you can have success. The reason why it never succeeded since 2013 is because that, that link is missing. In the U.S., they have that link through an, a small business administration 
which is a cabinet level position, and they have had it probably, I think, for around 30 years. So when you have that concentration of effort at cabinet level, which then reports to the president, then it gains traction. Why the Kenyan one has, gained, has not gained traction is because then you left it at the mercy of a, a parastato. It has no muscle to push anything. Uh, Dr. I must ask you this question as we wrap up. We have seen you in Kenyan wildlife. We have seen you at Equity Bank. We have seen you at Chumi. We are now seeing you at Jubilee. For those of us who analyze this market, some of us say, this guy is a jack of all trades, probably a master of none. How would you respond to that? Um, I'm not a jack of all trades. I am a master of a management skill. Okay. There's a course I used to teach at the University of Nairobi and uh, some other places called the Gender Systems Theory. The Gender Systems Theory shows you what is common ag across all systems. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, whether it's a church, whether it is a government, whether it's a business like Jubilee, okay, they have the same common trend, exactly the same. And so therefore, how it, if you master that, then you can manage any entity. So that is where the skill is. Yes. So it, it's irrespective of industry. So it doesn't matter the portfolio, the principles are the same across the board. So the key thing is to master the principles. Once you understand those management principles as espoused in the general systems theory, and you master them deeply, you can run any system. Right, I wish we had more time for this, but that takes us to the close of our conversation with Dr. Julia Skipping at each on a raft of issues uh, right from dead capital.